Well, this morning, <clears throat> we're only going to be looking, <clears throat> excuse me, at two verses of Scripture. In uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. And the reason why we're not taking a huge chunk this morning is because this is really one, one idea. Okay? Each paragraph really contains one main idea, though it contains a lot of ideas in that one main idea. They're usually working all towards building up the main point. And in, in this particular section, we have also a main point, and uh, the main point is that the Lord, in His justice, is going to treat us the way that we treat other people. So uh, we're going to take a running start at this as we, as we get into, um, the, um, into the sermon, but I wanted to say at least that much so you understand what, what this is talking about. So let's read the text, verses 37 and 38. Jesus says, do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Okay, I hope you see the gist of this. This is what Jesus is talking about, okay? We're going to be treated the way we treat other people. Now, so far our Lord has told us in this particular sermon that if we belong to Him, if we are true believers, if we, if we love Him, we will be putting His kingdom first. And He showed us what that looks like in these Beatitudes. We will do it, first of all, by recognizing our own bankruptcy when it comes to righteousness, when it comes to what we need to be acceptable to God, we'll see that we have nothing and we will trust in Jesus Christ alone for our acceptance with God. Uh, our being converted it will be, uh, again, expressed or realized by our giving up everything in order to follow after Him. Remember, seeing ourselves as stewards rather than as those who possess what we possess, that these things don't belong to us, but they really belong to the Lord, and being willing to use them in the way that He calls us to. We will be hating and putting off our sins. Blessed are those who weep, who are weeping over our own sins and grieving over the sins of those who are around us. And I think our Lord means to the point where we're willing to reach out and do something about it. I think many times today we're, we're not even affected by the sins around us because there's just so many of them and we're, we're immersed in them all the time. It just seems like business as usual, but we do need to realize that those sins that they're committing are going to destroy them in the end if they don't turn away from them and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So... Those who have the Spirit of God in them will be grieved by the sins of those around them as well as our own personal sins. Now, <clears throat> our Lord also told us, secondly, that if we are true believers and, and this grace is working these things in us so that we are grieving and reaching out to other people and trying to turn them away from our sins, that we are living a, a godly life, He said we will be hated by the world. He said we won't be in the in crowd, rather we will be social outcasts, which means we will not fit in. As a matter of fact, we'll even be looked at as evil. And I think today the word is, is intolerant, bigots, you know, because we don't accept everything the world is, is accepting. But, but what's going on here? We're, we're trying to, to do what is right and we're trying to speak the truth so they might be saved. They're looking at, at us as intolerant and so they think we're evil. And they're good. Jesus says we're blessed when people treat us in this way. But that is what is going to happen to us for being like Jesus, living like Jesus, and speaking like Jesus. And that's why Jesus told us that we need to count the cost before we begin to follow him. We have to be willing to pick up the cross, which is the instrument of our death. We have to be willing to die to ourselves and see ourselves as dead to the world and to the things we might gain from this world in order that we might gain the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is what we must be willing to pay. We must be willing to be hated for Jesus and to be outcasts in his name. But our Lord Jesus told us, secondly, when we are hated, 
that we need to respond, not in kind, but uh, in the opposite way, okay? They hate us. We need to respond in love. Jesus says we are to return good for their evil. We are to bless them. We are to pray for them. We are not to retaliate or try to get even with them, but rather we are to serve them when we see them in need. Now, in short, Jesus told us that we need to treat them in the same way, that we would want them to treat us if we were in the same situation. Treat others in the way you want to be treated, Jesus says. And, and that's exactly what the Good Samaritan did. He, you know, that's when Jesus said, love your neighbors yourself, and the uh, scribe said, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus gave him the story of the Good Samaritan. He didn't tell him essentially who his neighbor was, but he did say who a good neighbor is. And a good neighbor is somebody who sees somebody in need and helps, tries to help to meet that need, even if that person happens to be their enemy. And that's why Jesus used the Samaritan and put him in the good position, the, the good neighbor position, and why the person needed to help was a Jew, because they were enemies of one another. We need to treat them in the same way we would want to be treated. Now, again, I just want to remind us that when we look at the Beatitudes and, and just like what we've just looked at with regard to forgiveness, we need to remember that Jesus is not telling us that we need to do these things in order to be saved. In other words, be good enough and then I'll accept you into heaven. That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is, is he's, he's already saved us if we're trusting him. And he's given us the power to do these things. He's given us the power to be like our heavenly father. So we are to be like our heavenly father who is kind, he says in Luke 6.35, kind to ungrateful and evil men. The father loves his enemies. We are to love our enemies. And our Lord Jesus Christ does this and that he might basically show the world who he is. I mean, Jesus finished his work. He ascended into heaven, but he has left his spirit with us to make us like him so he can show the world what he is really like. That's why he wants us to do these things. Now, Jesus said, if we do this, we will not only prove to ourselves and to others that we really are the children of God because we're reflecting his nature, but he also said he will reward us. Now, this morning, I think he goes on to tell us what these rewards are. And let me just remind you again, when Jesus is talking about here, there is a relationship between, you know, what he is saying we need to do and what we're going to receive. But that it, it is a relationship of justice. You do this, you get that. But it is a relationship or a reward of grace. Jesus is the one who has done these things and who gives us the ability to, as it were, uh, do these things so that we can receive these blessings. I hope we see the, the difference. It's not, you're earning, we're not earning these things. These are rewards purely of grace. We can only do them by the power of the Holy Spirit. But let me also say this, we have to do them, okay? We must be doing these things if we are true believers and if we are to receive the reward. So what are these rewards? Well, the first is that we will not be judged. Jesus says in verse 37, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do you not want to be judged? <laughs> then don't judge, okay? Now, first of all, I think Jesus appears still to be talking about how we are to respond to our enemies, Okay, I think he has those in view because they are the ones we're going to be tempted to judge. They are the ones we're going to be tempted to condemn. They are going to be the ones that we're going to need to pardon. They are the ones he's told us that we should help when they are in need. So Jesus certainly is including our enemies in who we're not to judge, condemn, and, and who we're to pardon and so forth. But I think we should also see this as applying to everyone, obviously even our brothers and sisters in the Lord, because we can all be just a word or maybe an action away from becoming one another's enemies. Isn't that true? I mean, friends, close friends can become enemies almost instantly 
depending upon what happens from moment to moment. So we need to be responding this way to all people at all times. Now, first of all, Jesus tells us, commands us, not to judge. Now, we've probably heard somebody say at one time or another uh, when they've done something wrong and we come to them and we try to call them to account for what it is they've done. You've probably heard them say something like this at some point in your life. Judge not, lest you be judged. You know, who are you to judge me? Jesus says, you can judge me. Basically, you have nothing to say. I'm not going to listen to you, is what they're saying. Okay. Uh, but the question is, is that what Jesus is telling us to do here? That's, you know, are we never to judge anyone in any sense? That's the way a number of Christians actually see this passage. Well, Let's ask a few questions about this. If that was true, if Jesus was telling everyone everywhere, because the commandments are for everyone, that they may not judge anyone in any sense, then how could the government function, particularly when it comes to, you know, justice, uh, the penal law, you know, the idea of um, police arresting somebody for something? How could they reward those who do good? How could they punish those who do evil, as Paul tells us God calls them to do, if they are forbidden from forming an opinion regarding somebody's actions, right? I can't, can't judge whether that person is doing right or wrong, so I guess I'm not going to do anything about it. That's not the way the government works, and it's not supposed to work that way. Okay, how could the elders of the church know whether or not to admit somebody to membership if they weren't able to evaluate what a person says about their belief and about their life. If, if they, you know, if we couldn't tell they had a, what's called a believable profession of faith. You know, we don't just allow anybody into the church, but people who are professing the true Christ and who are claiming to believe in Him and who have a life that's consistent with that. We have to make judgments, you see. How could we know whether or not to receive somebody who comes to us as a brother and says they're a brother and sister in Christ or to avoid them as bad company if we weren't allowed to make some kind of determination regarding their spiritual state? How could we admonish each other in the Lord as we are called to by Paul unless we're able to form some kind of judgment about what we are doing? I mean, when you admonish somebody, you're basically saying, look, brother or sister, you're, you're doing something wrong, and you need to, to go this direction. You need to do what's right. But how can we do that if we couldn't judge what they were doing according to the Word of God? We have to be able to make some kind of judgment. And, of course, when it comes to who it is we're supposed to listen to, which is, is as teachers, as we're going to look at uh, this evening, how could we tell whether or not we should listen to what it is they're actually telling us unless we're able to compare what they're saying with Scripture and make a judgment, make an evaluation. The point is, Jesus is not telling us here that all judgment is wrong, but what he is saying is this, that if we happen to be in the habit, and he is talking about a, a habitual uh, sort of pattern of doing this, if we are in the habit of criticizing other people, you know, judging them, criticizing them quickly and unjustly because we're prejudiced against them in some way, then we need to repent of that. Now, Gill says that Jesus here, John Gill, the um, Reformed Baptist commentator who was a contemporary of Jonathan Edwards in his commentary, says that Jesus here is referring to this rash judgment, interpreting men's words and deeds in the worst sense and censuring them in a very severe manner. You know, the, the word Jesus uses in the original language here is the word crino, from which we get the word criticize, and I think you can see the, the similarity in, in words. Now, I think that what, what Jesus is saying here, perhaps a clearer way of saying this, translating the force of what Jesus is saying is this, you are being critical of other people unjustly. You need to stop doing this, okay? Now, Jesus goes on to tell us that if by the Spirit of God, we are overcoming that spirit of criticism and we are able to do, you know, basically the opposite, to build them up instead of tearing them down with our words. Uh, if, if we will do this, you know, again, if we'll, if we'll practice what he told us about previously, 
put ourselves in their position and treat them in the way we would want them to treat us if we happen to be the one who, having done that thing, do we want to be scalded by criticism or do we want to be helped? Well, if, if we will do this, which, again, Jesus has already given us the power to do, Jesus says, do not judge and you will not be judged. In other words, you will not be criticized. And Jesus actually states it much stronger in the original It should be translated more like this. You shall by no means be judged. Now, I don't think he means that absolutely by other people, although we do have to admit that if we uh, criticize people relentlessly, we often find that we get criticized as well. You know, what, what we deal out to others comes back to us, and the reason why it does is because of what the Lord is saying here. Do not judge, and you will not be judged, right? But more importantly, the Lord will not judge us and he will not criticize us because we're in Christ and we are safe and we are perfect in him. Doesn't mean he doesn't want us to change. You know, we have to change, but we have to be moving in that direction. But if we are, God is being gracious to us and he will be gracious to us. Now, the second blessing is, and another very important one, we will not be condemned. Jesus says, do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. The idea here is very similar to the first, that we are not to be quick to judge our enemy guilty and deserving of punishment and desiring to see that punishment poured out on them. Now, again, what is Jesus not saying here? Jesus is not telling us that we cannot very carefully, very prayerfully and deliberately observe somebody's life, come to a conclusion about their actions, whether they're good or or bad, or about even their spiritual condition, understanding that we might still be wrong and act on that conclusion for for their good, you know? I mean, we're not to say if we conclude they're unconverted, well, then let's just... Get rid of them. No, that's, that's not what we do. But if we conclude they're unconverted, then we reach out to them and we try to bring them to Christ. Jesus is not saying that, again, we can't make these evaluations, but what he is saying is this. We, again, need to put ourselves in their shoes and treat them the way we want to be treated, that we not condemn them so quickly. You know, there's a wonderful example of this in Scripture where a couple of the disciples, the apostles actually, uh, blew it in this regard. Remember James and John, sons of thunder, when they were traveling with Jesus and they went to a Samaritan village and the Samaritans would not receive Jesus and James and John got all worked up and they, they judged them and they condemned them and they said, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to just burn this village to the ground? And Jesus said, looked, looked at him and he goes, you, you don't know what you're talking about. I didn't come here to destroy men. I came here to save them. And you see, that's, Jesus wants us to turn from that James and John kind of an attitude. And he wants us to turn to his attitude. Now, if we happen to see the kind of attitude James and John has or had in their hearts, they don't certainly have that now, we need to repent of that, okay? We need to turn away from that and put that sin to death And if we do that, and again, the Lord tells us he has given us the power to do this, then we will not be condemned. And the reason is because we have trusted in Jesus. And the evidence is we no longer have the heart that wants to destroy everyone. We we have a heart that desires God's mercy on them. So we will not be condemned. I think there's a sense in which if we're not going around condemning other people, we're going to find that people aren't condemning us quite so much. But more importantly, we will not be condemned when it matters most, and that is on the day of judgment. The Lord will not say to us, depart from me, you wicked, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. God is not going to condemn us if we find within ourselves a heart that is not condemning other people. Now, the third blessing is we will be forgiven. And, and these obviously go together. In verse 37, pardon, and you will be pardoned. If we are letting go of the things that other people have done to us, if we are showing them mercy as a pattern of life, we will be forgiven. 
Now, what he means is we are forgiven now. Uh, again, it, it applies to other people. If we happen to be gracious and are forgiving other people, they'll tend to forgive us more. But more importantly, it means God has forgiven us for our sins. That's the reason why we won't be condemned on the day of judgment. And on that day, we'll be acquitted, we'll be forgiven, we'll be declared innocent, and we will enter into the new heavens and the new earth. Now, the bigger question is this, and we already understand the relationship of this. Remember, we're not doing this to be saved, but if we're saved, we'll have the ability to do this. Do we need to forgive our enemies, even if they never ask for forgiveness? Because oftentimes our enemies don't, do they? Well, the answer is, and we, and we need to understand this, the answer is yes, we do need to forgive them. Okay? We need to forgive others if we expect to be forgiven. We understand that we won't be fully reconciled to them unless those who injure us ask for our forgiveness and we grant it to them. There is that relational issue, right? We're not going to be close to them. We're going to be at odds. But we still need to forgive them. We still need not to hold a grudge against them. We still need to want to be reconciled with them, even if they don't want to be reconciled with us. And again, I would again point to the premier example of this, our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, praying for the people who had mercilessly beat him and mocked him and then crucified him. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. I think we'll assume Jesus had already forgiven them from his heart, and he was praying for God's mercy on them. This is what Jesus talks about when he says, bless those who curse you. Jesus was in praying for those, right? Jesus was praying for God's blessing on those who had brought a curse down upon him. How can we do that? Well, we can do it only through the power of God's Holy Spirit, whom he's already given to us if we are trusting in Jesus we do need to work on it, though, don't we? Because none of us are perfect in this area. We all struggle, perhaps, with this more than just about anything. Now, the final blessing is this. We will be enriched materially. Jesus says, give, and it will be given to you. Now, he's already told us that we need to give to those who ask, those who are really in need, even if they happen to be our enemy. Here he tells us that if we will do that, if we'll be like the Good Samaritan, I mean, what happened to the Good Samaritan if this were a real story? What would have happened to the Good Samaritan after he went on his way? Do you think the Lord would have struck him and began to impoverish him for what he did to the Jew? According to this, he was probably, well, he would be blessed, okay? He would be greatly blessed. The Lord would reward him. As a matter of fact, the Scripture says, whoever lends to a poor man is actually lending to the Lord. And the Lord is the one who will repay him. Well, here he tells us that if we do this, it will be given to us. Verse 38, they will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You know, when I read this, this verse, it reminded me of a church that I attended years ago where the pastor used to quote this verse every single week. And he would do it just before the offering was taken. And he would say, if you give to this church, or essentially if you give to me, then God will make you rich. He will give to you. He will give you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will he cause men to pour into your lap? So you pour into my lap, God's going to pour into your lap. Okay, that's essentially what he was saying. Uh, but that's not what Jesus is saying here, is it? He's, he's not saying give to the church and God's going to bless you, although we know we're responsible to do that. But what he's saying is if we give to our enemies when they are in need, like the Good Samaritan, if we are generous with them, God will be generous with us. He will move others to give to us. And how much will that be? Well, verse 38, by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So if you're generous, God will be generous. If you're not generous, God will not be generous. We will be blessed to the same degree uh, that we bless others. So again here, notice the justice of God. Okay? If we don't criticize, we won't be criticized. Okay? By the Spirit of God, we're putting it off, then we're going to find that God's not going to be critical of us, others may not be critical of us. 
If we don't condemn, we will not be condemned. If we forgive, we will be forgiven. If we give, it will be given to us. And again, reminding us again, what is, what is justice? Uh, read the Old Testament. You've heard the expression quid pro quo. This, uh, this used to be an expression, you know, uh, this for that, you know. Uh, you give me this, I'll give you that. Uh, there's the idea of the scales in the hand of uh, blind lady justice, remember? And it's, it's really saying that the punishment should meet the crime and they need to be equal. You see, they need to be equal. That's what justice is. That's what we see here. You do this, you get this, the same thing. You do it to this degree, you get it to this degree. And it actually works the negative way as well, doesn't it? If we, if we don't know the Lord and if we don't do what he commands in these areas. If we don't stop criticizing others, we're going to be criticized. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 2, For in the way you judge, you will be judged. If we continue to condemn, we will be condemned. If we're not willing to forgive, we're not going to be forgiven. Again, I would remind you of those words we read in our meditation. And again, we, these things need to sink into our minds. Our, our Lord takes these seriously. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Some people interpret this to mean that this is talking about relationally. We're still saved, but... But, you know, our relationship with the Lord is broken. But that's not what he's saying here. He's saying you and I will not be forgiven if we do not forgive others. Because if we do not forgive others, it means that we haven't experienced God's grace. We haven't had that great debt forgiven that allows us to forgive the small offenses that others commit against us. It's, it's a test of whether or not we are saved. It is not the path to salvation. And then, of course, if we are tight-fisted, God will be tight-fisted with us, especially with regard to his mercy. So in closing, let me just simply say this. If these negative things happen to, to describe what our lives are like, and we're not working to overcome these sins, to put them off and put them to death and become like Jesus, it's very likely we don't know the Lord. Okay, I think that is the conclusion. If we can't forgive, if we, if we condemn and, and we do all these things, we really don't know the Lord. And if, if that is what you see within your heart this morning, if that's what the Lord has shown you, you need to realize you can't change your own heart. You need to look to Jesus because he is gracious and he is merciful. And if you come to him truly desiring his mercy and grace, he will give it to you. The Lord says, anyone who comes to me, I will certainly not cast that person out. We realize we can only come by the grace of God in the first place. And certainly, if we come by the grace of God, Jesus isn't going to turn us away. But that's the only answer. We need to turn from our sins. We need to turn to Jesus in faith. And he will give us the ability to do these things. And for the rest of us, again, we need to remember that none of us here are perfect. And we are all falling short. And we are all struggling in these areas. But if we really belong to Jesus... We want to improve. We want to become more like him. We will find ourselves actually doing these things and wanting to do them even better. And so if that is the case, may the Lord give us the grace to continue to seek him for his mercy that we might find greater strength to do this. And certainly this is one of the ways by being reminded of what it is we're supposed to be doing and what it is that should be true, praying, worshiping, and coming to the Lord's Supper are all different ways in which the Lord strengthens us if we believe in him. If we do not, then the way is to Jesus only. We need to come to him first. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to uh, uh, apply what we've just heard, and then we'll take a few moments and prepare to come to the table.